fancy electronics. I think I'm going to use so paper and pencil. I'm going to assume that that flashing red light means we're on. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Um, again, thank you all for being here. Thank you for helping us test out this terrific technology here. We'll learn a lot from this experience today. And I also want to make sure that you know that the information that was gathered um, in this public opinion survey is available to you. Um, we have had one request to um, receive um, some additional information broken down either by county um, or by zip codes. We'll do our best to accommodate that. And um, if anyone has any other um, requests, please um, jot them down and we will be sharing them during the question and answer period, which will be at the end of the, of the hour. Um, again, we have distributed pens and note paper around the room. Um, and we are asking our remote participants to submit their questions in writing and out of consideration for our remote participants, we're going to ask our in-person participants to, to write down their questions, issues, comments, and submit those in writing too. So we have a record and we can share them with you all. Now I would like to introduce David Kennedy, principal with Corona Insights, the firm who conducted the survey, statewide survey, and Matt Bruce, also with Corona Insights. Thank you and welcome everyone. I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Matt um, and David, and here we go. Let's get this show on the road. I'll just kick things off here real quick. Um, as Casey said, my name is David Kennedy. I'm a principal with Corona Insights. Um, I was actually involved in the same study that we conducted, or similar study we conducted back in 2007 and 2008. Um, if you're familiar with our old report, um, as a few of you I'm sure are, and you're wondering what happened to our name, we rebranded in 2009. So the old report has a Corona Research name on it, and now we're Corona Insights, just in case that caused any confusion um, comparing the two. But um, we'll get things, um, we'll jump right in, I think, actually, in terms of the findings. We want to leave as much time as we can for Q&A. Um, and I think, you know, probably the best way to handle Q&A with um, people in person and online, we'll just save it towards the end. Um, if anything comes up, you know, in the middle, we can maybe try to address it quickly. Um, but it's probably just more efficient to put it towards the end. Um, so with that, I'll turn things over to Matt Bruce here, who's our lead analyst, senior associate on the project. Um, this year. Great. Thanks, Dave, and thanks, Casey, and everybody else for coming today and allowing us to share the results of this survey and this project. It's been a really fun project for me. Uh, you know, I, I have a background in environmental studies and natural resources, so I really appreciated working on this project and excited to share some of our results and insights and share some things that we think you can you know, use uh, in your work moving forward. <clears throat> So yes, this is a public opinion study on water quality, uh, results from surveys of Colorado residents in 2007 and 2014. So our agenda today, uh, we'll spend just a little bit of time talking about background and methodology, uh, and spend most of the time looking at the key findings, including the importance of water, uh, people's motivations to protect water quality, and the actions that they take to protect water quality, uh, something I'm, I'm sure we all love, septic system maintenance, uh, and then a little bit of time on education and communication. We'll review some key findings, and then as Dave said, we'll try to save about 20 minutes for questions and answers at the end. So a quick background and methodology description of this study. Dave and, and Casey and, and some other stakeholders and I all sat down at the beginning of the project to create some objectives. And one objective was to understand Colorado residents' opinions and a lot of their behavior towards preserving water quality. We wanted the results of this study to be comparable to the results in 2007 and see how opinions have changed over time. And to an extent, that dictated some of the, uh, you know, our methodology. It needed to stay the same and, and a lot of the same questions. So that was an objective. And then lastly, we also wanted to provide results on a statewide and regional scales. You know, here at, at the top of the Rockies in Colorado, uh, we have, you know, so many different watersheds and scales of watersheds that, uh, you know, the reality on the western slope might be very different than the Front Range or the San Luis Valley. And so we wanted to provide uh, 
results where people can say this is you know this is my area and, and this is r relevant to me. So we did that. This was a telephone survey, so you know, we got on the phone and we called uh, just about 1,900 residents of Colorado. Uh, I think the only screening was that they had to be 18 years or older. Uh, and we called uh, just a, a little bit less than 400 per region. We have five regions. Uh, we'll look at a map of regions in just a minute. Uh, we did call a mixture of landlines and cell phones. Clearly, a, you know, a lot of people in Colorado don't have landlines, and, and so we called about 40% landlines and 60% cell phones. And then we applied corrective weights to the data to uh, help mitigate known biases. Uh, and, and really, this, that way, the results would be more representative of the broader population. Here's a, a map of our regions. We have five regions in blue, the western slope, San Luis Valley in orange, light blue is eastern mountains, front range in green, and eastern range in purple. Uh, through the rest of the presentation, when we did break results down by region, we'll use those same color schemes. And we'll have labels so you don't have to memorize that right now, but uh, you can use that as a guide. The margin of error was generally around uh, plus or minus 5%, and that was both statewide and regionally, uh, which is a, a very important component that we can look at results by region and still uh, have high confidence in the results, or that, in other words, that the results are, uh, you know, very close to what the entire population in that region thinks or feels or, or represents what they did. We'll go ahead and talk about some key findings now, uh, starting with the importance of water. We asked a question, I think the first question on the survey asked uh, participants to tell us what was the most important environmental issue in Colorado, and we gave them five options. And we see that water pollution uh, is, is really the most important environmental issue, at least of the five that we tested. Uh, we also notice uh, in this graph the uh, triangles or, or diamonds on the left were the results from 2007 and on the right they're for 2014. And we see a pretty uh, strong increase in the percentage of statewide residents saying that water is the most important environmental issue. Uh, so you know, I, I think that's pretty surprising and, and a big difference between that and then the second most common response, which was air pollution. This graph breaks down or shows the percentage of people who responded that water pollution is the most important environmental issue by region. So you see the regions on the right. And we see that the importance of water pollution was highest in Eastern Plains and in the San Luis Valley. Uh, and then moving down Eastern Plains, Front Range, and Western Slope. And we're actually going to go back and forth. Uh, you know, in, in some of the, the upcoming slides, it will point out Eastern Plains and San Luis Valley uh, sometimes hold similar patterns. And for example, on this slide, uh, we asked respondents to tell us the, you know, just in an open-ended question, we asked, where does your water come from? Where does your water originate? And we saw some pretty big differences by region. You know, that's probably expected. Uh, and in the Eastern Plains and San Luis Valley, uh, you know, a lot of folks are saying that they get their water from well water or groundwater. Uh, you know, for most of us, that's probably not too surprising. But remember that those were also the two uh, regions where they said water pollution was the most important environmental issue. Some other patterns that we see on this graph include uh, the front range having uh, the highest responses compared to the other regions, uh, saying that they either that their water comes from the government or a water company or water conservation district, uh, that the water comes from a tap or bottle uh, or store, or that they don't know where their water comes from. So, kind of picking on us front rangers uh, in, in this finding. I think the good news is most residents believe that home drinking water is safe to drink. 
Uh, we didn't really see much of a change across different regions since 2007. You know, back then most people thought, you know, about 90% or so of people thought their home drinking water was safe. That's still the case. We do see a, a little bit uh, smaller percentage in the eastern plains. We also asked folks if they thought that water in their local area was clean enough for swimming. And again, you know, a majority of people in each region believe that to be true. Uh, we did see generally across four of the five regions an increase in that belief. Uh, and again, on the eastern plains and this time the front range, uh, you know, a little bit lower proportions of people saying that true compared to some of the other regions. So we, we asked folks to tell us if several different pollution sources uh, had an effect on water quality, and we asked them to respond by saying that it has no effect, it has a minor effect, or it has a major effect. And to help display the results and to compare results between one year and another, uh, we did a little bit different analysis here. Basically, we assigned a number to each of those three response categories, so no effect, if they said that, they scored a zero. If, it was, if they said minor effect, we assigned that the number one, and if it was major effect, we assigned that the number two. That way we could calculate averages, and that's what these numbers on this graph represent, the average of respondents in 2007 and 2014 who, said, who answered the question about pesticides and septic systems and vehicle fluids and so on. So a higher average number means that more people were generally saying you know, it was a major effect, and lower numbers mean more people were saying, you know, minor or no effect. And that makes it easier to compare across years. And what we do notice is that, you know, the top three uh, potential pollution sources in 2014 are, at least perceived sources, are pesticides, faulty septic systems, and fertilizers. Uh, and no, actually, fertilizers and exposed soils was not asked in the 2007 Question. So that's why we don't have a bar to represent that year. Uh, but those three pollution sources are seen as having the greatest effect. Uh, and I don't display the results here, but just to mention Front Range, again, kind of uh, pointing them out, Front Range residents were most likely to say that each pollution source had an effect on water quality compared to uh, any of the other regions. Uh, and we found this uh, interesting. We asked respondents to tell us who is responsible for uh, oversight of water quality. And we, we gave them several different options, things like state government, local government, um, nonprofits, individuals. I think there are a few other responses as well. And uh, we did find an effect by age regarding belief that individuals are responsible for oversight. And we see that there's a pretty big difference, that younger respondents were more likely to believe that individuals are responsible for water quality oversight. So what are some of the motivations for uh, protecting water quality? You're probably thinking dogs, what's, you know, what's this got to do with it? So we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, and so we, we did ask uh, folks to tell us if uh, the impact on X, Y, or Z was motivating or not motivating uh, in terms of that motivating them to take action to protect or preserve water quality. Uh, so we asked about items such as impact on public health, improving wildlife and fish habitat, health of your pets, and so on. And we see that for the impact of public health was the most motivating factor to improve water quality, again, out of the items that we tested. That was the case in 2007. That remains the case in 2014, uh, you know, with a, a very slight increase uh, since 2007 of that uh, motivating factor. Uh, again, improving wildlife and fish habitat was second most common. Uh, we did find it interesting that we had two components that increased uh, quite a bit compared to 2007, and those were uh, the health of your pets and also the ability to recreate on, in water. Those two are increasing compared to 2007 as motivating factors, 
reasons that you would want to take action to improve water quality. The health of your pets increased uh, to the greatest extent, so we'll dig into that. Uh, this, uh, these numbers represent responses to people who said that, uh, uh, or who answered the question about motivating, being motivated by pet health. And we see that most of that increase is coming from the Front Range, uh, and then also the, the Eastern Plains and Front Range. Now remember, this, this was a statewide survey, and most people out of all these regions live on the Front Range. So anything that the Front Range does, any difference that you see in the Front Range is going to dramatically uh, affect the statewide results. And so that's somewhat uh, you know, what's going on here. Uh, we did see actually a, a really small decrease in uh, people in the San Luis Valley saying that pet health was a motivating factor. So what about taking action to preserve water quality? <clears throat> we asked uh, several questions about uh, taking action, and, and so we'll uh, kind of look at the first one here, and then I'll actually show results by uh, segment and by their response to this question uh, in a few slides coming up. But let's look at this first bar. We asked people if, to what extent they agreed or disagreed with the statement, I personally take action to preserve water quality. And the good news is that on statewide level, uh, a lot of folks are taking action to preserve water quality. 90% said that they at least somewhat agree that they take action to preserve water quality. Uh, you know, and few people saying that they disagree to that. So that's good news. Again, that's statewide level. Uh, we also asked a question uh, if folks uh, agreed or disagreed with the statement, I am worried about water quality in Colorado. Uh, again, we see more than, you know, a, a major we see a majority of people saying that they at least somewhat agree with that, you know, right about 70% or so uh, saying that they agree with that, though, you know, more saying that they disagree, that they're worried with, about water quality. So regarding that top bar, uh, we did look at uh, those scores and, and we looked to see if there were any differences by region or uh, gender or education or, or many other variables. We actually didn't see much variation there. So we didn't see any differences by region. Generally, re across all regions, people are saying that you know, they take action and, and across genders and education levels and so on. Uh, however, we did see some differences with that lower bar uh, regarding worry of water quality. We found that females and those with uh, less than a bachelor's level of education are more likely to be worried about water quality than males or those with a bachelor's degree or higher level of education. So let's dig into that uh, bottom bar a little bit. Uh, and look at worry about water quality in Colorado uh, by region. So, you know, we talked about gender and education, and then we also saw some differences by region. Uh, and worry about water quality is lowest on the front range. Wrong button. There we go. All right. <laughs> uh, so worry about water quality is, lo is lowest on the front range uh, and then the highest uh, there on the San Luis Valley. Uh, that correlates with what we found earlier about water quality being the most important, or water pollution being the most important environmental issue in Colorado. Uh, that was high on the San Luis Valley as well. Then we asked people to tell us to what extent they agreed or disagreed with the statement, people in my local area take actions to preserve water quality. And a lot of times what other, you know, what people's neighbors are doing or what people they know or their coworkers are doing, that often influences what they do. And we saw, again, that was lowest in the front range and highest on the western slope. And then we asked, uh, you know, but while, while I'm saying lowest on the front range, also notice that it is net above zero, which means that more people are agreeing than disagreeing, even in the, in the region where it's lowest, being the front range. Uh, and then we also asked folks to tell us if they would be willing to pay more in taxes or fees to protect water quality. Uh, this was a kind of net zero 
for the eastern planes. So the average score was uh, you know, just as likely to be agreeing as disagreeing in that region. And then uh, had this, maybe you could call it strongest support or average support on the western slope for paying more uh, to protect water quality. So do you remember that question that we asked people to what extent they would agree that they take action to preserve water quality? Well, the labels on the right of this graph, uh, we classified people into three categories. We said either they take strong action you know, by their responses, they take some action, or they take no action. So we, we created three categories, and that's the dark green, the light green, and the red. And then we cross that by their responses to, here on this graph, two other questions. Uh, those are on the left. My actions can affect water quality, uh, downstream water quality, and that they could agree or disagree to that. And then my actions take, uh, actions that I take can affect the quality of my drinking water. And we see the stair-step pattern for both of those. And that's kind of an indication to us that there's some sort of relationship. There's something going on here. And as people are less likely to agree that their actions can affect downstream water quality, they're also less likely to not take action, as they're more likely to agree that their actions do affect or can affect downstream water quality, they're more likely to take action. And we saw that with both uh, affecting downstream water quality and also actions that they take can affect quality quality in, of their own drinking water. So this is, to an extent, you know, who's kind of affected? Is it me or the people right in my community in my own drinking water? Or is it a little bit of the kind of free rider, you know, well, whatever I do, I mean, it's more affecting the downstream people and, you know, maybe we don't care about them as much because, you know, the water flows downhill and, and it's not affecting me as much. So we looked at both of those dimensions. <clears throat> Uh, now, instead of that question about taking action, uh, this graph shows the other question we talked about, the worry over water quality. Remember about 70% of people said that to some extent they worried about water quality in Colorado. So we have here three classifications, very worried, somewhat worried, or not worried about water quality. And then the two questions on the left are the same as before. And again, the main point here is that we're seeing this pattern where those who are not worried about water quality are less likely to be their actions will make an impact. The analysis, this analysis is showing that there is a correlation. You know, we, we don't necessarily know if it's uh, causal, if it's actually causing worry or actions, uh, but you know, it's, it's a pretty strong relationship and something is, is going on here. <clears throat> we also asked uh, folks to tell us some of their behaviors that they take that they've taken in the past uh, maybe several months. I actually don't quite remember the time frame. Maybe six months or three months. Uh, so we asked if they prevent leaking auto fluids. Do you use a commercial car wash? Do you change pesticide use and so on? And they could respond by saying yes, I did so for water quality. Yes, I did so for not, but not for water quality. No, or not applicable. So you know, a lot of the times a behavior is not applicable because maybe people don't have a yard, so they don't use pesticides, or they don't have a dog, or they don't have a car, and so uh, that's why you know there is a not applicable component. And what we see, you know, so here we're kind of looking at, you know, we like to see green, we like to see, say, a lot of dark green, but I think any green is probably good. It means they're doing the behavior, the desired behavior, and we don't want to see a lot of red. Uh, we are seeing that people are using a commercial car wash, although much more so because, you know, not for water quality, but maybe for other reasons, because they don't have maybe a hose in their yard or, or you know, for other reasons. Um, and then what we're seeing a lot of on the, the, the highest behaviors where people were not uh, conducting that behavior were collecting grass clippings and changing fertilizer use. And we've talked about the, the collect grass clippings. Uh, you know, I, I don't quite remember the wording on that one, but uh, we weren't we didn't necessarily ask, do you sweep uh, your grass clippings out of your gutter? 
which is really the desired behavior, is just not letting grass clippings run down into an open uh, you know, uh, stormwater drain, but rather keeping them on your grass area. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, also, changing fertilizer use uh, was the second most common, uh, and then pest changing pesticide use, third most common action that was not taken. So if, when, when any time anybody said that they did not take an action, we asked a follow-up question about that particular behavior. So why did you not change fertilizer use? Why did you not remove grass clippings? Uh, they, we asked that in an open-ended manner. They gave us responses. We reviewed all those responses and then coded them into categories that were you know, generally similar. So uh, there on the left, reasons for not changing fertilizer use, you know, things like, well, they cause no harm or no particular reason, I use them infrequently, and so on. Uh, we did find that across several of those different uh, behaviors that they could do, many residents did not believe that actions would help or were necessary. Uh, and so, for example, there on the fertilizer, you know, more than a quarter said that fertilizers cause no harm or, you know, that they're careful using fertilizers, uh, so it wasn't necessary. Uh, and then on the right we see, again, we talked about grass clippings, a lot of people saying grass clippings are, you know, good for the soil, actually about half of them saying that. So that's people responding, saying that they think, you know, it's, it's good to go back into the soil. We saw that with, uh, to, to a smaller extent, also with picking up dog waste, people saying, you know, it's good for the soil for, you know, the dog waste to go back in, into the soil. All right, so I think this is probably our favorite subject, uh, septic systems and maintenance. Going down the tube. We, in... <clears throat> In 2007 and in this year, we asked uh, folks just to tell us yes or no, do you have a septic system in your household? And <clears throat> this probably isn't too surprising. In rural areas, there's more septic systems, and in the front range, there's fewer septic systems. Uh, although, I, personally, I was actually surprised that we had about 20% uh, here, at least in 2014, on the front range having a septic system. Uh, we do notice that in the eastern mountains and eastern plains specifically, we had a decrease uh, compared to 2007 in the percentage of households that have septic systems. And then in the front range, we actually had an increase, uh, you know, pretty small, but still a notable increase <clears throat> in number of septic systems. So, you know, I think that's important to know, but probably what's maybe more important is how are these being maintained? Is septic systems, you know, are they causing problems or possible pollution sources, uh, to an extent we can, you know, obviously we didn't go out and measure, you know, how much pollution is, is leaking from septic systems, but we could ask a measurement of that by how often is it serviced, and with the assumption that if it's serviced more frequently, it's probably producing less pollution. And so in 2007, we see that on average statewide is about, you know, between 2.5 and 3, uh, uh, three years between every service system, or sorry, system service. Uh, we asked that again in 2014, and the good news is, across most regions, we saw that the frequency of getting your septic, septic system serviced went down. So here, going down is a good thing. It means it's being serviced more frequently, with a pretty big difference there on the front range. So you guys are doing well getting people to get their system serviced more frequently, uh, also, San Luis Valley and Western Slope are doing well. Uh, the Eastern Plains, uh, unfortunately, went the other way, and theirs are getting serviced a little less frequently. Uh, we also, you know, we looked at a lot of these questions through various lenses and across different tabulations. One that was notable to us is we did find older residents service their septic system uh, less frequently than younger residents, and, and older residents being 55 or older. Uh, and to an extent, this might uh, have a relationship with that previous slide where we looked at the population by region. Uh, some of our older population are living out in the eastern plains, so uh, you know that's probably an, an influence of it. Uh, older plains residents are uh, older on average. Uh, 
sorry, Eastern Plains residents are older on average. So about education and communication, we'll just highlight a few things here. <clears throat> First, Western Slope residents are most likely to have read, seen, or heard a water quality message. Uh, I might refer to that as being exposed to a message. It's just easier than saying read, seen, or heard, uh, so that you know they can see it in a, in a newsletter or a newspaper, see it on a TV, read about it in a pamphlet, or hear about it on the radio or, or personal communication, something like that. Uh, generally, older adults, males, and those with a bachelor's degree, uh, level of education or higher, we're most likely to have seen or heard messages. <clears throat> and then residents were most likely to hear these messages from the newspaper or television. <clears throat> so that's where people said that they heard messages specifically about water quality. We then asked people to let us know where would you uh, pay attention to messages that were about water quality or uh, <clears throat> you know water in general. And so you know we call that attention or you know where would they attend to, to messages? And we see uh, TV and radio uh, being at the top there. and then uh, places where people were less likely to attend to, were uh, emails, social media sites, and bus signs. Uh, you know, this isn't saying that uh, you know you should really focus on this and avoid those because there's other considerations. You know, such as cost of uh, you know media buys and and whatnot. Uh, but this is just where are people saying that they're most likely to attend to these messages. We broke that question. Uh, we also looked at. I thought, did I miss one now? No. Uh, we also looked at uh, where would they attend to messages based on that question about taking action. Those who took strong action were generally more likely to attend to messages across all sources than those who took some action and then those who took no action. And this is going to be the case for pretty much any subject that you might study. People, if it's relevant to people, then they're more likely to attend to it. If it's less relevant to them, then they're less likely to attend to it. And you can probably think of examples, things in your life that are important. You're going to be more likely to hear a story on the radio or you know, see an ad and actually pay attention to a billboard if it's relevant to you than if it isn't. So that's going to be the case. So here's the trick. You're probably, you know, and, and I know we have a broad range here, but for a lot of us here, we're probably wanting to uh, look at those who took no action because those might be the people that uh, are important to us for various reasons. And they're always going to be less likely to attend to some of these. Uh, and so if we look at the actually the bottom source here, uh, social media sites was the only place where those who took no action were more likely than others to say that they would attend to. Now, it's also, out of all of these sources, it was also their bottom choices as they, that they were least likely to attend to. Uh, but to an extent, it might be a... Uh, kind of a, you know another path to reaching uh, messages to reach uh, those folks. All right, so uh, we've talked about a lot of these results for, for about 30 minutes here. So we'll just kind of review some of these key findings. Uh, you know, I know that there was a lot there. There's a lot more in the uh, in the report <clears throat> uh, than what we could cover today in 30 minutes. But uh, just to review some of the key findings, including First, the top-level findings. One, reiterate, water quality is definitely an, an important issue, if not the most important issue, environmental issue, uh, at least that we tested. And that was statewide, and that was also across regions. Public health is the greatest motivator for improving, taking action to improve water quality. The vast majority of residents, I think that was about 90% of or so, took some personal action to preserve water quality. Many beliefs about water quality relate to worry over water quality. And then uh, residents who did not take action often did so because of good intentions. Uh, you know, they believed that they were doing uh, the right thing. Uh, some key comparisons to 2007. Again, that was an important part of the study. 
Uh, we did find that the importance of water quality increased dramatically since that time. Residents are more likely to believe water is clean enough for swimming than they were in 2007. Uh, generally, residents believe fertilizer have a, I'm calling it a minor, major effect on water quality. On a scale of 0 to 3, I think it was kind of at 2.5. <coughs> Sorry, 0 to 2, it was, it was like 1.5. Uh, for the health of pets is growing as a motivation to improve water quality. And then septic systems are being serviced more frequently. That's good news. Some regional results. These are just kind of some highlights I pulled out. Obviously, there's a lot more uh, that you can dig into. On the front range, we're least likely to be worried about water quality in Colorado and also least likely to know our water origins. Uh, I mean, you know, honestly, our water origins are pretty complex on the front range. Uh, so that might not be all that surprising. Uh, Western Slope folks are most likely to believe water quality, uh, sorry, local water is clean enough for swimming. Eastern Plains residents believe water pollution is most important environmental issue and least likely to believe their home drinking water is safe compared to other regions. San Luis Valley folks are most likely to have a septic system compared to other regions. And then in the Eastern Mountains are most likely to be, be attending to TV messages regarding water quality. So that's uh, what we have to present today. Uh, we'd like to thank you know, many of the uh, partners and organizations who have helped out tremendously through funding or uh, technical support or uh, you know, other ways. Certainly couldn't have conducted this research without uh, this great partnerships and collaboration. And at this point, we'd love to take any questions that you guys may have. And for anyone online, um, in case you're not seeing the chat box maybe on your viewer, um, there's a few different views you could click on. So if you look in probably the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see some icons. Um, one is a little chat bubble, a um, little speaking bubble, sort of like we have on our PowerPoint right now, only more square. Um, click on that if you're not seeing uh, a chat window. The other buttons there will just show who, who is currently online in the session. So hopefully that will help. Um, I haven't seen any questions pop up online. Did we have any in person? I had a question. If I made a note, it was on slide number 26, and, and there was a high number of not applicable, and I was wondering how come. <clears throat> I don't remember exactly what the question was. It's a complex question. Sure. On slide 26, you said? Okay. Yeah, that might be better. Too, so they can hear. And I'd just like to to reiterate for folks in the room, um, if you could, um, please just write down some questions. Write down the questions that you have. There you go. Um, we'll give people who are engaged remotely uh, time to write any questions or comments that they have, and then I think it'll also help us to communicate what those questions are. I want to thank Janice Lopez for submitting um, some comments and questions in advance. And I'll let Matt answer mm -hmm. Lucy's question, and then I'd like to go over some of the, the comments and questions that have been submitted in writing. OK, great. And that's a great question. Uh, I'll go ahead and read uh, what the respondents were hearing on the phone when they were, when they were taking this. Uh, this, is what it, it, this is what they heard. Uh, now we'd like to ask some questions regarding your personal actions related to water quality. Did you take any of the following actions in the past year? And if so, was the action primarily motivated to preserve water quality? Please respond, yes, to preserve water quality. Yes, but not primarily to preserve water quality. No or not applicable to each of the following. In the past year, did you change the way pesticides are used in your home lawn or garden? Change the way fertilizers are used in your lawn or garden? pick up dog waste, use a commercial car wash, perform maintenance to prevent leaking auto fluids, collect grass clippings for mowing, or cover exposed soil around the outside of your home to reduce erosion. So for each of those, they would say, yes, you know, because of this, or yes, but not because of water quality. No, we're not applicable. So that's the, the, uh, the question. And then uh, you know, we can see the percent of responses for each of those. And this is presented statewide. 
And I'll add in too, compared to last time in 2007, this was one of the questions that probably changed the most um, from the previous one. We changed a few of the categories. We broke out, I think, pesticide um, and fertilizer use as well. And one thing we added, um, probably the biggest change that we added is the not applicable uh, response option up front. So a lot of times people on the previous survey, um, we didn't have that as an explicit option. And then when we asked that next question, well, why? That's where we picked up DNA. Like, well, I didn't do it because I don't have a lawn or I don't have a dog or whatever. Um, so this time, just to make it a little cleaner and a little easier for the respondent to answer in a true fashion, we added that to the first question instead of picking it up in the second. Yep. Um, other questions we have in the room. If you want, there we'll come back to the chats online in one second. Um, one question was, could we look at the media attention choice by age group? Um, this would help direct media um, and outreach campaigns um, to lower uptake audiences such as age. Um, and we can. Um, probably the easy thing to do, we don't have that pulled up available for this presentation. So in addition to the full report, um, if you have that, we have a lot of that in the report. We also have a very large Excel deck um, of every question on the survey broken out by many variables, age, gender, region, education, I'm even trying to remember all the other ones we did. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it's, Education, and then those two questions that we came back to several times, take action to preserve water quality. Mm -hmm. uh, so if they disagreed with that, we have those broken out, and then also worried about water quality uh, broken out into three groupings. Yeah, so, and I honestly don't remember off the top of my head, um, primarily by age, what differences we saw in there. I don't know if you do math, but uh, we do have that available. Um, you know, that you can dig into every media source um, for both what they prefer and both what they reported, self-reported, having mm -hmm. seen, heard, or read. Uh, I can just, a few quick highlights uh, here. <clears throat> uh, TV, not much difference in age groups. Radio, uh, slight preference to younger adults, actually. Uh, newspaper, slight preference for older adults. Email, not a lot of difference. Kind of actually the middle, mid-age folks, uh, higher preference. Uh, online news sites, younger folks. Social media sites, younger folks. Um, bus signs, preference to younger folks. Uh, water, sewer, utility bills, nothing uh, really different by age group. Brochures and fact sheets, no difference by age group. Uh, information sent home by from children's school, a little bit higher for younger folks. And then received at place of work a lot higher by younger folks. So I have a few other statements here, and whoever wrote this may need to provide additional clarification in case we uh, misinterpret, but just wanting to acknowledge, one, the water plan. I'm not I don't know if it's for you to... These are things that happened this year, and I, right. I just think they probably informed the survey responses. So that's... Sure. I, I don't know if it goes in a summary. I don't know if it goes in an appendix. So in another 10 years, we all remember why these exactly, survey results yeah. may have been why they were. But I don't know if this is appropriate because I'm not a survey firm. All right. But I think these did inform it. So you think the general public knows about the water? Yes. I do I'll, hope so. I'll read the five here. It's water plan, change in auto fluid... The question. question we changed this year, we took it from somebody pouring something into a storm drain to mm -hmm. leaking vehicles, which I think mm -hmm. is more, I think it probably influenced compared to 2007. I'd like it acknowledged somewhere. Sure. Uh, the grass clipping issue, uh, San Luis aquifer, um, aquifer, aquifer issue. Aquifer, and I can't remember what year that was, but I think San Luis Valley is much more attuned to their drinking water source than they were pre that. Mm-hmm. And I think we see that in this survey, but I could be all wet, too. Mm -hmm. And Mesa County TV exposure. We learned campaign. after looking at the results earlier this week that one of the reasons Mesa County may have such strong awareness is because they have TV ads, which I do not believe anybody in the Front Range is running. All right. We have cable in a lot of our communities in the Front Range, but we don't have mainstream TV. Mm -hmm. I do not believe. But I also could be all wet. It's just a suspicion. I just think those might be something that we put in an appendix of, you know, and I don't know. Or maybe we all remember if we're here in 10 years. <laughs> I don't know. 
I'll let yeah. you guys decide. I will say for changes in the survey instrument, um, we do track that. So if you actually look at, I think we have this document in here. Um, so if you actually look at the full report in the appendix, the survey instrument, we have a lot of other coding in there. So we have a lot of red text that's programming. So we, that's for the phone room to say, randomize these questions or um, don't ask this verbally or something. Um, and then we have blue notes that are um, design notes. So every question in there that changed from the previous iteration, it is noted. And they're saying this is the same as 2007, same as 2007, same as 2007, except A, B, or C. And I think we might want to make note of the fact that um, we intend to follow up this survey um, with some focus groups and the, the kind of um, the, the points that you make, Janice, I think can be acknowledged and, and um, pursued a little bit more in those focus groups. Mm -hmm. I think those are really good suggestions. If I could just point out um, again, um, Janice, in response to one of your questions, if you look at the detailed research findings, which are on page nine of the full report, I think there's just a typo um, under the demographic, under the age demographic, um, where all of the numbers are in percentage with the exception of the over 55 age group, and that's just in mathematical notation. So if you go from 0.29 to 29%, that's 29%, and, that and it adds up to comments. 100%. So we'll correct that in the, in the report to make sure there's no confusion on that one. Um, let's see. Can you scroll? I think we had some messages on. Um, mostly we're just communicating with right. folks here um, to make sure that they are in the chat box. But now I'd like to acknowledge that Al Quintana is with us, Joe Chaplin is with us, and Krista Maharg is with us, as well as That's Betty one, as same. Betty Blindy. Um, so if you have any questions, comments, please um, go ahead and type them in a little. Um, text bubble, and um, I, I think another option we do have would be to just unmute the microphones at this time and just see if everybody wants to chat. We have a few minutes left in the... Sure. And the only other one I had here is just discussing next steps for the bigger picture, now what, um, what, what next steps with this information. Okay. Well, in, and in large part, that's what we're here to discuss. Um, we have um, Tammy Allen and Lucia Machado here with the Water Quality Control Division, and be happy to hear from um, from either or both of you with respect to next steps. Um, the division has arranged for the funding through the Water Resource Power Development Authority. Um, and so they have a, a strong interest in um, pursuing next steps. And I know we have a great representation here from the Stormwater Council, who also has um, a strong interest in next steps and, and where we go from here. Um, Tammy, Lucia, do you, would you like to? Sure, I can. Um, you know, we started this uh, for a couple of reasons. The first one was just was time to check in with the public files. about water quality perceptions. We hadn't checked in with the public since 2007. We had a funding opportunity. Um, and this money is specifically tied to the statewide water quality map. Uh, so we Tell have- nobody can hear you, just a minute. Nobody can hear you. Thank you. I'm trying to signal here. Is you need, you need a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Can you yeah, hear me right. now? Can everybody hear me now? Hopefully, anyway, I'm sure you can hear me. Um, so we we wanted to check back in with the public since it had been since 2007. We had a funding opportunity, and that funding opportunity is through the Water Resources and Power Development Authority. We had some money that was focused on the statewide water quality management plan, which is a plan we finalized in 2011. And one of the initial um, steps we hope to take after finalizing our first version of what we call the SQUIMP, so if you hear me say SQUIMP, it's Statewide Water Quality Management Plan, 
was to figure out what to do with the document from here, basically. And part of that was to check in um, with folks in some sort of systematic way, develop some sort of outreach strategy tied to that plan, especially at a regional scale. So we were lucky enough to secure some funding from the Power Authority to help us revisit this survey as kind of that initial check back in with the public to help us then continue the conversation about, especially at a regional scale, um, but also at a statewide scale, how we could do better in terms of outreach and education um, across a number of programs within the division, but especially tied to the statewide water quality management plan. So that's where we're at. Um, we are very interested in dialogue as we, as we continue forward towards our focus groups because we do intend to move into a, a focus group piece of this survey as our next step um, we, because we have additional money. Um, <laughs> we're able to do that thanks to the power authority. So I think we're going to march along pretty quickly uh, to get to the focus groups. And so again, I think this is an opportunity to hear from everybody there um, what they feel about what we've done so far and uh, uh, help us as we move forward towards those focus groups and targeting information the best we can through those fo focus groups to get to, again, for the division this is, we are looking for opportunities and ways to really define a more systematic outreach approach at regional and statewide scales with respect to water quality and water quality management and water quality planning. Hopefully that helps. So, and this is Casey, and I would just like to say that, um, again, with the help of our stakeholder groups, and I'm looking at the Stormwater Council folks here right now, uh, because we have really appreciated the time and attention that you've taken in this first um, round of um, revisiting the survey, and would certainly plan to continue to work um, with with all of the stakeholder groups that we have identified um, and with the Stormwater Council, which has a good broad um, reach. Uh, we have other plan, other presentations planned, um, again, to, to bring in, um, hopefully to, to spark interest um, and to provide opportunities for for all water quality professionals to understand this survey, to um, to use the results, to participate in the in the planning for the focus groups, um, with an eye toward um, developing information that is useful to our stakeholders. I know we're just about out of time here. Um, were there any other questions? Apologize if we missed any online, but I think we have everything covered there, um, and I think we covered everything in house here. Um, have any other closing questions, comments, real quick? I'm not sure if we get kicked out at noon or. <laughs> well, this this is a terrific facility. Um, for those of us who are here, it's kind of like being on the deck of the Enterprise. Um, at the CAVIA at Metro State University. Um, for those of you who participated remotely, I want to thank you very much um, for down. your there might be a new message. patience. I'm looking, um, I'm looking at a, a note here that I'd like to acknowledge um, from Kristen Maharg. The Foundation for Water Education is hosting a Water Educator Symposium on March 11th. Um, we um, will coordinate with Kristen on, on possibly making a presentation um, at that event, we are planning to make this information available at the Roundtable Summit um, in, in, I think it's March 12th. Um, and Chris and I have your note here. Um, I'm mentioning the symposium. Uh, and that's, that's it. That's all I'm hearing. We will definitely be um, sending out um, a little debrief after um, we leave here today touching base with all of those who um, made the effort to um, join us remotely, um, to try to figure out what issues we can resolve. Um, Colorado Watershed Assembly as a statewide organization is, is looking for ways to communicate 
broadly with our constituents who don't happen to live in the Front Range. Um, we appreciate this facility being made available to us and would like to visit again and use it again possibly to work with um, other roundtable education liaisons as well as the Colorado Watershed Assembly membership in general. Um, this is not the end. This is not the last you'll be hearing from the, the group about the um, water quality survey and follow-up. So again, I just want to thank Corona Insights for their very professional work. I want to thank Tammy and Lucia for um, helping shepherd this through and thank all of you who were here to participate and um, took a, actually read the survey and took a look at it and um, we appreciate your comments and suggestions. Um, with that, um, I'll, I'll, I'll just throw in real quick too, um, if anyone does have lingering questions, requests, I know we had a few um, even mentioned before the meeting, um, probably send those to Casey and then she can direct those to us and that way we everyone's on the same page but we're still happy to do any follow-up um, you know we personally love not only doing the research but we wanted to see see it be used and you know benefit so if there's one piece of information that you have a question about or need something else please let us know we want to make sure you have what you need to make the most of it great right. Kristen Betty Al Joe thank you all for joining us thank you everybody So long. That's all, folks. Okay. Now, um, I'm not going to do anything for fear.